Good morning. A very warm welcome to our webinar. I'm Kerry Withers, a solicitor and partner at Clark Wilmot and our property litigation team. This morning, I'm joined by Tara Mosley, a solicitor in my team, and um, Arjan Dojan will be from the, part, the Monarch Partnership will be joining us shortly. Unfortunately, um, we had a slight technical delay in that Monarch were on the line and um, had internet issues just as we were about to go live. So apologies for that. Tara is a solicitor who specialises in leasehold matters and she's going to talk to you about Section 20, why it's important and how landlords can seek dispensation from the tribunal, specifically in relation to energy matters. Taj, uh, Tara will then hand over to Arj. Arj is the Chief Operating Officer at the Monarch Partnership, a successful family-owned and run business. They have over 30 years' experience managing clients' energy, water, waste and telecoms contracts. They act for private and public clients and estimate saving over £120 million in energy costs and refunds. Like ours, their key sector is property and housing, with over 200 housing association clients across the UK and Ireland. The Monarch Partnership's key focus is on energy efficiency, clean energy, and helping to make organisations more sustainable, which obviously is in all our interests. Once Taj uh, and uh, once Arj and Tara have finished their presentations, there should be about 15 minutes left for questions. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function, and we will do our best to answer them at the end. Alternatively, please feel free to contact us direct. Our contact details will appear on the final slide. So, without further delay, I'll hand you over to Tara. Thanks, Kerry. So this morning, I'm going to be providing a general overview on the basics of the Section 20 consultation procedure and the dispensation in relation to energy contracts. And what we're going to be covering is where the legislation can be found, who it applies to, what it means, what it requires landlords to do, dispensation itself, and then top tips for making an application for dispensation. The relevant legislation setting out the consultation procedure can be found in Section 20 of the Landlord and Tenant Act of 1985, hence why it's often referred to as the Section 20 process. Section 20ZA of the Act provides the Tribunal with the power to dispense with all or some of the consultation requirements if it considers that it is reasonable to do so. And then we've got the service charge regulations and they supplement the legislation and they set out the precise procedures that landlords must follow in relation to consultation. So who does the legislation apply to? Well, the process applies to leaseholders and this includes shared owners, but what it doesn't extend to is short-term tenants, for example, those who are occupying properties under an AST. Now, initially, it was only applied to leases of flats, but has now been extended to apply to all residential leases. And it requires, the legislation requires all landlords to comply. So whether landlord is a public body or a private individual, it's going to apply. Section 20 requires a landlord to consult with leaseholders who pay service charge before either entering into a qualifying long-term agreement or carrying out qualifying works. And we'll talk in some detail in just a moment of, of what those categories are. But the objective of Section 20 is to ensure that where a landlord is intending to undertake either qualifying works or to enter into a qualifying long-term agreement, that the leaseholders are firstly consulted and they're provided with an opportunity to, to essentially have their say. Um, so unless consultation has been complied with, or dispensation from the tribunal has been obtained, a statutory cap is going to be placed on the sum which the leaseholder has to pay towards those qualifying works or the long-term agreement. If we um, look at the regulations now, so the regulations provide two categories for which consultation is required. The first of those is in relation to qualifying works, and this means works on the building or any other premises and consultation is going to be required to these works where the leaseholder's contribution is going to be more than £250 for each set of those works. 
The second category is in relation to qualifying long term agreement, and this is what we're concerned with today because contracts for the supply of energy are going to be regarded as a qualifying long term agreement if they're entered into for or on behalf of the landlord for a term of more than 12 months and where the cost recoverable from any one leaseholder is in excess of £100 in any one accounting period. So turning to the schedules now, um, which are annexed to the regulations, depending upon the nature of the item in question, the regulations direct us to one of four schedules, um, and each schedule sets out specific provisions for the consultation process for the landlord to follow in order to comply with the procedure. And Schedule 1 deals with qualifying long-term agreements where public notice is not going to be required. Schedule 2, again, is in relation to qualifying long-term agreements, but this is where public notice is required. Um, Schedule 3 deals with qualifying works which are carried out under a qualifying long-term agreement. And so this is what covers off our, our framework agreements where, work, where works are conducted under such framework agreements. Um, and then finally, Schedule 4 refers to standalone qualifying works. So for the purposes of energy contracts, we're going to be concerned with the first two schedules, as this is what refers to qualifying long-term agreement. Um, however, Schedule 2 is only going to be required where the overall cost of the agreement is substantially high enough to merit notice being served under EU regulations. So if the contract is higher than the threshold, which is currently around 189,000, um, public notices must then be placed in the official journal of the European Union and confirmation that this process has been carried out must then be factored into the consultation process, which is covered under Schedule 2. Obviously, this is all subject to the impact Brexit is going to have, but the government have got a lot on their hands at the moment. So I think um, for the time being, we just need to ensure that this is being complied with and, until we're told otherwise. But in practice, this is, this is not going to be required very often. Um, and so today, I'm, I'm only going to work through Schedule 1. So in summary, Schedule 1 sets out a three-stage notice process. The first being the notice of intention, followed by the notice of estimates, and then a final notice being awarded, um, be, being sent out, sorry, containing details of the decision and the, the notice of award. So if we look at each of these notices in turn, the first of these is, um, is the pretender stage where the notice of intention is served on leaseholders. And what that notice of intention should include is details of the services to be provided in accordance with the agreement, but also why those services are needed. The notice should also provide access to any supporting documents. And at this stage, leaseholders must be given a 30 day period to respond. And of course, landlords will have a duty to have regard to those observations. The next stage is the tender stage, and this is where the notice of estimates are to be provided to leaseholders. And what must be included within that notice at this stage is any response to the leaseholders' observations which have been raised in the pre-tender stage, um, a list of estimates from the contractors. If any of those contractors are associated with the landlord, then this must be made clear to the leaseholders at this point. Details of how each estimate is calculated and also an estimate of the costs which are payable by the leaseholder should also be included at this stage. And again, the leaseholders need to be provided with a period of at least 30 days to respond with any comments. And the final stage, the award of contract. Now, this is only going to be required where a nominated contractor has not been appointed to conduct the works. Or, the, or carry out the services, sorry, and where the lowest tender has not been commissioned. So after the 30-day period um, at the tender stage is over, the landlord may then move on to award the contract. The landlord, again, is required to take any comments or proposals made by the leaseholders on board when making his decision. And within 21 days of entering into the contract, the landlord must inform leaseholders why the contract was awarded must respond to any observations and provide a facility for the leaseholders to inspect the contract. 
Now, the energy market doesn't operate in a way which is going to allow leaseholders, um, landlords, sorry, to follow the Section 20 consultation. If a landlord followed the process for energy contracts, then the flexible energy procurement methods are not going to be able to be used and the best energy deals aren't going to be achieved. And Arj will be talking to you about this a bit more later on this morning. Now, as we've seen from the consultation process, it's slow and it's not going to work for landlords who need to enter into an energy contract quickly. So the options for landlords at this stage are to either take the risk of entering into the contract without complying with Section 20, but of course they will then have to bear the costs um, above £100 per leaseholder, which of course is going to be very costly to the landlord. So the second option, which is the option that we recommend, is to apply to the tribunal to dispense with the obligation, um, and this should be done so prior to entering into the contract. It's, it's, it is possible to do it retrospectively, but our view is that the best protection is going to be afforded to landlords if the dispensation application is made prior to those um, to the contract being entered into. So if we now have a look at dispensation, a landlord may apply to the first tier tribunal for an application to dispense with the Section 20 process. At this stage, I just want to note that that dispensation power, which has been granted to the tribunal, it only extends to statutory consultation requirements. If there's a provision within the lease for any consultation requirements, this will still need to be complied with as the tribunal doesn't have the power to dispense with those requirements. Um, applications for dispensation in respect of energy contracts are often made by landlords on the basis that the information required for each stage notice of the consultation procedure can't be provided due to the way in which energy is procured. So, for example, prices of energy are fixed at the point of purchase, and so it's going to be difficult, of course, for landlords to provide notice of estimates and the information which is required to be included within those, um, within those notices. Also, there's a limited time to accept prices due to the volatility of the energy market. And again, this is going to be something which Arj will, will be talking to you about shortly. So the tribunal will dispense with the consultation requirements if it considers it's reasonable to do so. And they must also be satisfied that no prejudice has been caused to the leaseholder as a result of the landlord's failure to consult. The leading case for dispensation is the Supreme Court's decision in De Gien Investments Limited and Benson. Now, in this case, the landlord gave its notice of intention to carry out major works and then proceeded to award the contract. Well, of course, the tenants then issued an application to the tribunal on the basis that the consultation procedure had not been complied with and the costs of the work were not reasonable. The landlord made a subsequent application for dispensation, which was refused by the lower court. So the tribunal, the upper tribunal and the Court of Appeal all refused the landlord's application. Um, now, the Court of Appeal said that the landlord's failure to consult had caused prejudice to the tenants. However, on appeal to the Supreme Court, the decision of the lower courts was reversed. And the Supreme Court said that given the purpose of consultation is to ensure that tenants are protected from paying for inappropriate works or paying more than is appropriate, the issue the tribunal should focus on is to what extent the tenants have been prejudiced by the landlord's failure to comply. So the sole question that now faces the tribunal when considering how to exercise its jurisdiction is what prejudice has been caused to the leaseholders from breach of the consultation requirements. And applications for dispensation will no longer be refused simply because the landlord's failure to comply with the consultation requirements from a procedural perspective. There also has to be this element of prejudice, which is the burden is on the tenants to prove. Now, as a result of this decision, dispensation is likely to be granted in the majority of cases, and it will usually be granted for energy contracts albeit sometimes the tribunal will impose conditions upon their decision, such as they will limit the, um, the landlord's ability to be able to recover the costs of those proceedings. So why should you seek dispensation when entering into an energy contract? Well, the advantage of doing so will be the certainty that the cost of energy will be recoverable through the service charge. 
However, this does not mean to say that the leaseholders cannot then challenge the reasonableness of those costs, and that's a point to be aware of. Um, and secondly, the consequences of failing to consult or, dis or obtain dispensation will mean the statutory maximum of £100 per leaseholder is imposed in respect of the cost of the energy contract. And as we've seen earlier in this presentation, um, consultation is, is not going to be appropriate for energy contracts, which leaves the, the option available to um, to apply for dispensation, which is why we recommend it due to the consequences of failing to do so. So on this next slide, I just set out the procedure for making the application to the tribunal, and this is how we can help you. So proceedings are commenced by issuing the application to the tribunal together with a supporting witness statement and any supporting documents. There's an application fee which is payable to the tribunal in the sum of £100 at the point of making the application. And once the application has been issued by the tribunal, it then needs to be served on leaseholders. Now, in our experience, the most efficient way of doing this is going to be um, uploading the documents on an online portal as opposed to sending out copies of the application and supporting documents to each individual leaseholder. As we know, you know, in, in some properties, there's going to be hundreds of leaseholders, so the cost of doing this is going to be very expensive, which is why we've, we've used these online portals previously, and they've, they've proved to work quite well with the tribunal's permission. Once it's been served on the leaseholders, the respondent leaseholders then have a period of 28 days to respond and advise if they've got any objections. It's not very often that objections are going to be raised and the majority of the applications made to the tribunal will be dealt with on paper. However, if an objection is raised, the tribunal will lift a hearing to hear the evidence from both sides when making its decision. But in the majority of cases, it's more straightforward and no objection is going to be raised and the tribunal deals with the application on paper and a decision is usually granted within the, the space of two to three months of the application being made um, sometime sooner. And the decision notice will then need to be served again. And, and this, this again can be served using the online portal for efficiency, which is, which is what we've done in previous situations. Um, once dispensation has been granted, the landlord is then free to enter into energy contracts to, to procure energy. And, and here I've just set out some recent decisions made by the tribunal where dispensation has been granted in respect of energy contracts. And all of the decisions that I've referred to here have been made by the tribunal on paper without the need for a hearing. I don't intend to go through each of these decisions um, because largely they've, they've been made, the, the, the applicant landlord has made the application on the same grounds and the tribunal has reached the same conclusion. But for, um, by way of example, I just wanted to touch upon, uh, upon the reasons given in the most recent decision of popular housing and this decision was granted in, in March 2020. In this case, the applicant landlord sought dispensation in relation to two qualifying agreements. The first being the supply of gas to communal boilers at the property, and the second being electricity supply to the whole building. The landlord's case was that entering into the proposed contract would provide more competitive rates than if it were to be a pay-as-you-go customer. It proposed to enter into a fixed-term contract, as this is what offered the best value. Um, it was good value for money, and it gave the best price for leaseholders. The landlord provided evidence to show that the energy market conditions are volatile and entering into a contract, this fixed term contract, would provide stability of those prices, which of course is the best situation for the leaseholders when passing those charges back through the service charge. The application also highlighted the issues with the Section 20 process and the unsuitability for um, entering into a qualifying long-term agreement in respect of energy. It set out that bids for energy are placed and contracts are usually signed within 24 hours. And so on this basis, of course, the Section 20 process is, is not going to be appropriate here, which is why dispensation is, 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 is required. And in this case, as with the other cases set out on this slide, the tribunal considered if there would be any prejudice to the leaseholders. They were satisfied that there was no prejudice to leaseholders as a result 
of the landlord's failure to comply with the consultation procedure and they decided that it was reasonable to make the determination for dispensation. So finally, I just wanted to run through a few practical tips to consider when making the dispensation application. And the first of those is to engage with leaseholders early and notify them of the intention to enter into the contract for energy. This will ensure that there are no surprises for the leaseholders and that they are kept informed of the process. And this, this same principle will also apply to notifying the leaseholders that an application for dispensation is being made. Again, this will, this will ensure that they can expect the application and they're not, um, they don't get any, any surprises. If at all possible, the application should be made well in advance of entering into the energy contract, as this will allow plenty of time to obtain the decision from the tribunal and to deal with any objections raised by leaseholders, if any. You should also prepare a list of leaseholders and collect all of their details, as this will be required when submitting the application. And particular problems have arisen when the leaseholder is not resident at the property. So to overcome this, correspondence should be marked to the leaseholder if their, na if their name is unknown. The application will also need to be served on any recognised tenants association. And so you should identify well in advance if there is one in existence and the details of them to include within the application. And as I touched upon earlier, when we went through the procedure for making the application, you should consider uploading the application and any supporting documents and, of course, the subsequent decision to an online portal. This is going to save the expense of copying the application and sometimes voluminous documents um, and serving on potentially hundreds of leaseholders. And just a final point from me in relation to service, service by email is not good service and service will need to be affected by post. And so that, that covers off everything from me this morning. There'll be time for some questions later on. I'm not sure if Arj has been able to, to join us again now. But um, yes, hi Arj, I'm just going to hand over the Thank button you. to Arj. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Very informative. Um, and, and hello to all that joined us. Um, I think. What Tara said is, is 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 really good in terms of what we're trying to achieve, um, and and the kind of the main headline would be to deliver value uh, in terms of what we're doing with energy contracts. Now we have a lot of lot of customers um, with us today, and, and and a lot of guys we work with, um, and over the past kind of five to ten years, the the explanation or or, or or the considerations for housing associations have been um, what can we do around Section 20. Um, and, and the pitfalls we've we've normally heard and, and, and found have been um, it's very time consuming, cumbersome, uh, laborious, and and uh, in terms of of kind of the economic climate and, and and everything that's happened since since the previous financial crisis, it's been very risk averse. The easiest thing to do is um, go for kind of a 364 day contract, one year, uh, and then move on from there. I think what we're seeing now with the onset of of looking towards renewables, a net zero future. Um, and the costs related to uh, energy um, as, a, as, a, as a total uh, cost for, for each organisation, as they start to kind of amalgamate together, it's, it's a bigger, bigger component of, of what you guys are doing. Um, and, and with that, obviously, comes the legislation around it, the, the increase in non-commodity costs and, and kind of government levies and taxes for the use of energy. So we think it prudent now um, to really um, kind of qualify and, and, and introduce a service to make Section 20 dispensation streamlined. And the reason for this is because of, it, it unlocks so much value in terms of um, preparing and, and managing your energy consideration and costs in the future. Um, so how do we do this? How do we unlock uh, energy savings for your residents ultimately? Um, well, as I kind of touched on, dispensation we believe is the best route. Um, and we can do that by utilising Section 20 legislation <clears throat> to move past a one-year fixed contract um, due to a volatility of the market B, um, the, the, the power to, to move to, to either a long-term fixed contract or um, a more kind of um, risk-managed product uh, whereby we, we open up a wrapper of three to five years uh, for your organisations, um, introduce a risk policy um, via, via kind of or, or post-Section 20 uh, dispensation um, and then really start to harness the value and, and, and the cost efficiencies within that um, because of the volatility of the market. 
Now, kind of added considerations and benefits for this are, are looking at your, your billing and cost, cost transparency within the contract. I did allude to non commodity prices um, kind of before, and, and they're making a bigger part of, of, of your bill. And what we can start to do is really kind of look at that at a granular level. Because on your kind of billing schedules now, you receive kind of a fixed term contract, you'll, you'll have your, your pets per unit. Um, and, and potential standing charges. Now, what we can do in a flexible contract is really unpick that uh, and, and see all the different components of what makes up your commodity and non-commodity elements, um, and then start to kind of uh, look at that with a fine tooth comb and ensure that, that you're only really paying for what you use um, at the end of the day. Um, now, the basis of, of, of one to go through the dispensation route is obviously unlocking value, um, and that's just due to the, the volatility of the market. Um, as, as Tara alluded before, kind of using Section 24 for other uh, more product or, or transactional um, commodities is, is, is a bit simpler, but in the energy market, um, there's always a very narrow window in order to, to trade and do business just because of the nature of the commodity of energy. Um, now, what we see is, is different factors um, playing into that volatility. Number one, obviously, being, being supply um, of, of, of oil, uh, which leads and, and really drives gas and, and, and electricity markets. Um, as you've seen before and, and probably seen in the news, um, there's, there's a lot of trading, a lot of kind of um, what we call kind of a, a cartel between, between kind of the Middle East states, America, uh, and what Russia are doing. And now each one of them, depending on what treaties they have in place and the geopolitical situations that we have with, with, with the different leaders, um, really play a factor in, in, in what we're doing uh, in, in, in terms of the supply of energy. So um, earlier this year, we, we had first kind of um, situation where, where, where Western um, kind of the, the Texas intermediary uh, and the oil price there actually turned negative for the first time. So they're actually paying people to take oil off their hands and, and bits and pieces like this can really throw the market out. Um, add to that the geopolitical situations and tensions arising from, from, from kind of America, um, what we're doing with, with China and, and the Middle East, and then benchmarking and selling pricing also has a knock-on effect on, on, on the gas uh, and electricity prices that, as an end customer, you'll pay on the commodity side. Um, those geopolitical tensions also hit the non-commodity side when we look at government levies and taxation, um, and we introduce um, kind of new trade agreements post-Brexit. Where does that leave us, and, and how much of a, a premium will that put on our venture prices going forward? Um, weather uh, also has an effect. Uh, we had the piece from the East earlier this year, um, obviously natural disasters making themselves more apparent. Um, and it's kind of the normal um, seasonal fluctuations that we have and, and how that impinges on, on, on when to buy and what time to buy and what, what, what the volatility in the market will be. Colder winters or warmer winters um, reciprocally in the summer periods will, will have a knock-on effect for, for prices within that period. Um, so, again, buying on one day a year for a fixed period um, isn't the most um, kind of sensible way of, of planning uh, what we're going to do for, for our energy pricing or, or, or costs going forward. Final will be the economical situation. Um, obviously, the big buzzword and, and, and a, a huge pressure on the market recently has been due to COVID, um, and, and that has had a, a real big effect um, in terms of where the market was, say, April and May, and the lack of supply. Um, and then how that's pushed and, and, and the kind of market situation going forward. And then we can see that um, quite evidently on, on, on a nice graph here, which is the least technical, I hope, <laughs> in terms of, of what we're looking at in, in terms of energy prices, but gives a good indication of what we've seen in gas, electricity, oil, um, and coal prices over the last six years or, or seven years. Um, so we did have a, a, a bust um, and, and a market depression um, in the late noughties after the financial crisis back in 2008. But as the economy covered, um, it slowly pushed up um, the, the, the oil pricing. As you can see, the lead in there and, and the track. Uh, when I talk about oil kind of pushing on and, and being the, the, the vanguard for, for gas and electricity, you can very uh, see that um, and highlighted uh, in the illustration. Um, they do track each other, uh, and oil is the, is the big kind of proviso over this, but as we move forward, we can see that, that different situations um, and different factors, as I said before, really do um, kind of have a, have a, have a bearing on, on your pricing. Now, in the old money and what we would do in terms of a, a fixed term contract for those that didn't want to go through dispensation is we'll track the market on your behalf, make recommendations, and then tell you the best time to buy. So 
for those that, that didn't want to go down a flexible route or, or a risk averse, um, it would have been fantastic if we could have um, locked in a contract, say, for, for, for one year in, 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 in kind of winter 2015, those prices, you'd have bottomed out the market. Um, and, and, and the itch, issue or, or situation then is when we came to reprice for the next year, if you didn't want to go down the dispensation route and hit the, the one year would be, once we track the market, you would have had an increase on your pricing year by year. And that would have lasted, and, and you've probably seen that when we've already placed one-year energy contracts up until kind of um, last year or, or obviously the beginning of this year. The issue that, that you face there when, when coming to budgets is you've had a big win because of the markets and, and what they've done back in 2015, but year on year, those budgets will have to change and you see an increase in energy pricing. Now, that's just the commodity side. When we had the non-commodity factors, which are making a bigger proportion of your bill in terms of risk premiums, um, government legislation, taxes, levies placed on top, whether that be kind of fit charges, CCL uh, increasing, um, renewable obligation charges, um, contract for difference, any of those those itemized um, kind of uh, bill or line items within the bill that, that you've seen attached for the last few years, that's nudging one end of the bill up. Uh, and then the other side will be your commodity charge, which which is obviously due to the, the, the volatility and pressure pricing up. Now, what we would want to see over that period is if we could go through legislation and trade on your behalf. We'd take advantage of all these little dips in the market by tranches of energy over that period in order for you to, to maximise and, and have the best pricing over that within that wrapper for three to five years. So instead of coming to renewal time and looking at October um, kind of 16's prices or, or where we were then, or even moving kind of a bit more into the into the recent past, if there was another renewal to do for, for October 18 and, and you're kind of um, forced into the peak of the market, there's no way of unlocking that over the next year um, and, and, and then actually making the most or, or making a value decision in that market period. Now, what we have obviously talked to our clients about and, and pre-COVID, we, we were very much in discussion with, with, with um, Clark Wilmot about getting this, this schedule and, and, and out there. Um, we've actually seen a benefit in terms of the market situation when it comes to COVID and, and kind of a crash. Um, it's been a whole economic crash and, and in terms of two big factors, COVID making all the uh, uh, under the economy and all, all the markets worldwide in terms of commodities crash, but on the other side, uh, an oversupply within the marketplace. Um, now, what we see there is is kind of a very much a, a first timer uh, within our industry, whereby just due to the oversupply of the market, not only are we seeing negative um, oil pricing and, and literally them, them, them wanting to, to pay guys to, to take their oil away. Um, we've seen a crash in oil prices, which leads to lower pricing in terms of, of, of what you're doing in renewals um, and, and your, your, your energy prices going forward, um, but also uh, the impact that that's had on, on, on the oversupply in terms of the green market. Now, we've had a lot of customers go, come to us and look for a green um, alternative, and, and then as we move towards that, um, in terms of energy efficiency. But the beauty that we have there is that they're seeing actually green uh, renewables and green pricing um, come up as a cost saving to where they were in terms of their fixed brown pricing a year ago, just due to the oversupply and crash in the market. So there's a lot of movement now in terms of, 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 of looking to, 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 to make the most of that. We One of our clients is, is, is a really prominent uh, Premier League football club. Um, and they moved over to a fixed term three year contract. Um, obviously, they're not bound by legislation, but the beauty of what they've done in, in terms of three year contracts is hit the bottom of the market in April on a green levy. So they're, they're, they're pure green. They're advertising that and they will do when, when it comes into to, to fruition in terms of, of their green partners going forward. Um, and that's actually at, at over £150,000 cost saving where they, where they were on a one year brown contract last year. So uh, kind of the crux of everything is is unlocking uh, or we're using dispensation to unlock um, options, and options bring bring about more value. Sorry about that. I'll just go back. Um, energy efficiency. Um, what we can see b because of the market bottoming out, and and, and obviously uh, the beauty of, of of finding value within dispensation would be gi giving you um, the options moving forward to 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 look at energy efficiency, net zero planning. Um, and, and kind of the headline would be to, to, to have a long term uh, planning over what we're going to do with carbon and, and, and the reduction and looking at what we want to do in terms of a green, green variable um, and, and a solution in terms of your forward planning in terms of contracts. Um, using dispensation, we can, we can really look at 
itemizing or, or, or looking at different sections within within the green package um, or energy efficiency in terms of on-site projects and regeneration um, cumulatively and finding what we can lock within there. Now, um, what we call power purchase agreements are long-term agreements that we have in place um, using a, a renewable asset um, around the country um, for potentially up to a five to 10 year period uh, where we lock in a base load of, of, of supply but then trade that other volume in terms of, of, of what that renewable uh, regeneration or generation looks like um, and extracting um, green energy from that source. Um, so you normally enter into a, to a long-term PPA. Um, we can sleeve that into a supply contract um, and then we will get a, a, a section or, or the majority of the energy usage from the individual asset which you sponsor. Um, now, from a community or, or, or communications point of view, that would be fantastic in terms of housing associations. We have one local authority in the Midlands um, that sponsored an asset within, um, within their, their, their remit and their domain geographically, um, and they're pulling a percentage of energy from, from a renewable source. Now, if we didn't go through, down the dispensation route, there's no way for you to access up to a five to ten year agreement to do that. Um, and, and without that, 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 that opportunity, there's no way to, to kind of unlock uh, potentially looking at green energy, looking at community piece, and actually looking at, at finding savings within that. So as we move to a net zero future, what we're going to have to do is, is make these considerations. Um, we also do a lot of work in terms of on-site projects um, and, and, for example, solar panels. We've found that, that the use of them and a lot of our clients have, have started to kind of introduce them into, into HQ or, or new developments. Is a 33% annual saving um, from using that as, as on-site generation. A lot of funding is becoming available as, as Britain starts to build again, um, and a lot of new developments are going up. So, for example, heat pump funding um, would, would be a consideration. Uh, and what we're trying to do here is, is to wrap everything that we can in terms of energy efficiency, sleeve that into your supply contracts. The only way that it will work is when we're looking for the longer term. Um, so. For net zero planning, um, for your energy usage going forward, uh, what we want to do is, is the only way that will be unlocked is, is, is for proper planning, and, and then there's no way around that unless we look at uh, dispensation. Um, just kind of a, a broad overview. I know pretty much everyone here knows who we are, uh, but, but as we've got over 30 years experience in terms of managing um, clients' energy and, and, and working with, with partners like Clark Wheel more closely on this, um, and we work with over 200 housing association organisations across the UK and Ireland. So we, we know what we want, uh, we know how to do it, um, and we know what other organisations are asking for going forward. Um, so partnerships like this uh, with, with Clark Wilmot are really, really um, good for, for, for not only the marketplace at the moment, but it fits a niche that I think everyone's looking for right now. Thank you. I think it's probably time um, that we hand over to, to, to Kerry um, to kind of finish up in terms of what we're doing. Um, and uh, like Tara said, we'll, we'll look forward to, to, to questions um, going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Arj. Um, we have a couple of questions, which um, I think we'll, we'll deal with first. Um, so Michael has asked, is the law in Scotland regarding consultation and dispensation different from that in England? Um, we are, um, the law that Tara has outlined is only that of England, England and Wales, and yes, it is different. Um, but we are not Scottish lawyers, so I'm afraid I can't tell you what the differences are. Um, the, in terms of, Arj, in terms of um, the kind of green options and what, what your clients are kind of going towards. You mentioned solar panels, but what, what sort of the greener options? Um, which are the, the main ones that clients are looking at at the moment? It, it's very much a, a, a what's in vogue um, at that time. So solar panels was, was a big um, uh, kind of, when the feed-in tariffs came in about four or five years ago, um, there was um, a, an advantage for, for having solar panels as an option. Now, geographically where we are, um, if, if we were kind of in, in closer to, 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 to a hotter climate and having more hours of sunshine, that, that would be an advantage. Um, but it's all dependent in terms of um, where we are uh, it, 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 in terms of the, the, the payback you're going to get over it. So there will be an element of infrastructure cost um, and, and just locating uh, what we're doing in terms of, of, of solar panels, um, whether there'll be a correct payback over that period, um, and then we can do kind of a, a cost-benefit analysis of that. 
And people have kind of moved away from, from solar panels, although they do still provide um, some advantages um, to depending where you are. So for example, if we look at um, sites or, or, or assets that we're looking at uh, in terms of sponsoring and, and obtaining energy from, if you're in a coastal area, um, wind farms are, are a big um, kind of plus point. Um, we have a lot of wind, um, especially um, on the coastal areas in, in Scotland and, and Northern Ireland. Um, so wind farms are, are great generations on site. Uh, biomass is not everyone's cup of tea, uh, but they do provide um, great on site generation in terms of, of, of um, more localized community buildings. Um, so for a big energy center, uh, normally we you kind of look at CHPs um, or, or, or biomass in, in terms of conversion of waste, um, wood chips as well. Um, so it all depends, I think, on the location, the size of, of any development that you have in place. And, and making a proper assessment of what will work in terms of extracting the most renewable energy um, out of out of that that, that site or location, um, and then putting that forward. Um, so it's very much a case by case, uh, but we can assist in terms of finding out what will work best um, viably in terms of extracting the most energy and financially too. Great, thank you. And we've had another question in from Stephanie um, in relation to, um, we referred earlier to leaseholders in the Section 20 consultation, um, but are you also obliged to consult with tenants where they live in a block with a communal utility supply? Um, the answer is it depends. Um, generally, yes. Um, if there is a service charge, some tenants obviously pay a fixed rent, which includes service charge. And therefore, it wouldn't apply to them anyway. But generally, yes, it will be tenants and leaseholders um, who will need to be consulted. Tara, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, nothing further to add there, Kerry. Thank you. Just as I touched upon earlier, um, obviously the process applies to all leaseholders who, are, who pay a variable service charge and, and won't, um, yeah, no, 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 that's it. Thanks, those tenants. No, that's fine. So, um, as Arj alluded to, um, we have joined with Monarch um, in making um, dispensation applications and um, we're very pleased that we can offer fixed fees from the legal perspective to deal with um, these types of applications for you if that's of interest. We'll circulate our brochure. Um, if there are any more questions, then please do set them, send them through. Do contact us direct. If someone can move on the slides, I think the last slide is our um, uh, our contact details, um, but you should have all those. There we go. So that's Monarch's, uh, Monarch's um, details and our details. We will circulate the slides after um, this webinar, as well as the brochure, setting out um, uh, how we work together in relation to dispensation applications. But if you do have any questions, then please do get in touch. We'd be delighted to hear from you. And thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much to our speakers, Tara and Arj. So I just want to say thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Tara. Um, thanks for the uh, guys at Clark Wilmot um, and for all the attendees. Again, any questions, uh, please let us know. Um, and and uh, we're, we're happy to, to answer any, any anything that you have on the energy side, or obviously please contact uh, Clark Wilmot for, for Section 20 questions. Thank you. Thank you for listening and joining us this morning.